Um, thank you, Shelley, and thank you, Tanya, for inviting me. Um, it's really great to be here. It's great to see so many people whose papers I've read and, and who I've learned so much from today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the UK's national DNA database. Um, but, of course, many of the things that I say will be relevant to what's happening here. And what I decided to do was actually keep my talk fairly short, uh, all the details in the longer paper. And I've done that because there's so many things I could talk about, frankly. I could go on for hours, and I'd rather be directed more by your questions and what you find is useful to you here. But before I start, I think we should remember, first of all, that this is an international issue. I think the politics of lobbying for these databases is a transatlantic issue. And I think we should also remember that the companies involved and some of the individuals involved are looking to roll out these databases across the world and into other countries. So we do need to think about those broad implications uh, in other countries. So the UK National DNA Database, roughly one person a minute is having their details added to our database. And it contains already over 4 million individuals. These figures are out of date. Um, they're last year's figures. I don't have the most recent ones. But we're getting on for about 7% of our population. So I used to say we were the largest database in the world. We've been overtaken, sadly, <laughs> by the US. But you haven't beaten us yet on percentage of population. Um, and it's called the National DNA Database. Um, but we do have different legislation. Uh, in the different countries. Uh, in, in particular, Scotland is different. So currently now in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, you can have your DNA taken on arrest, and it's taken automatically if you were arrested for any recordable offence and taken to a police station. Recordable offences are defined in legislation, but it's secondary legislation, can be changed very easily, and the number of recordable offences has become broader and broader over time. Recordable just means offences for which the police keep records. It includes begging, it includes being drunk and disorderly, it includes offences that can be serious, but that can also be very minor. So criminal damage is an example. There have been criminal damage arrests of children, uh, a 13-year-old who was arrested for allegedly criminal damage of a police car when she threw a snowball. Uh, I had a phone call about six months ago from a woman who rang up, who was a grandmother. She said, my grandson was arrested for throwing grass at the neighbor's fence, allegedly damaging the fence. And the other neighbor testified there was no damage. He had his DNA. He had his fingerprints taken. He was released without charge. Uh, but he's still on the DNA database. The policy is to keep both the DNA profiles on the computer database and the DNA samples until the individual is age 100. We don't know, quite know yet whether they're going to stick to that policy or not. <laughs> I'm not aware whether anyone's tested it. Uh, but it's not written in the legislation, so there's no legal requirement for them to remove your DNA, even if you get to 101. So. Um, and the law, as I said, um, was changed. Sorry, the law was changed in two stages. Uh, which is worth knowing. So there was a change in 2001 in the Criminal Justice and Police Act, and that was the decision to retain DNA after acquittal or when charges have been dropped. And that's the decision that's currently uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. So two individuals who've challenged that have finally had their case heard in that court, but not yet determined. So we don't know the outcome of that case. And then in April 2003, during the first week of the Iraq war, a late amendment was put in by the uh, Secretary of State for the Home Office to the Criminal Justice Act. And that is the amendment that uh, said we're going to take DNA on arrest rather than on charge. And that's the amendment that has significantly expanded the database and that uh, really received no debate whatsoever and no warning that that um, amendment was coming. Following that decision, Scotland came under pressure to change its law. Scotland already had legislation that allowed collection on arrest for a slightly narrower range of offences, for imprisonable offences, although bear in mind that does not mean that the individual went to prison for that offence. Um, 
and that includes relatively minor public disorder offences. But um, Scotland did not allow retention of DNA from innocent people, and we did quite a lot of work in Scotland to uh, encourage the Scottish Parliament not to accept that change. So they rejected that change. However, they did allow uh, some DNA to be retained after acquittal for up to five years, but with judicial oversight. And that's for people um, prosecuted for serious violent or sexual offences, um, where the police can request temporary uh, continued retention. And as I said, both the samples and the profiles are retained, so the DNA samples are kept by the commercial laboratories that analyse the DNA. Um, uh, there's an ongoing controversy, which hopefully will be reappear in Sunday's newspapers, about uh, the behaviour of the laboratories um, in the sense that or the behaviour of the system in the sense that the labs are being sent, the personal identifying indiv individual's information along with the samples. So in effect, we revealed back in 2006 that at least one of the laboratories was keeping um, a mini database of this information. And that includes people's names, people's ethnic appearance as uh, determined by a police officer, um, category of offence and other a small amount of other sensitive information. And those records on the, police, on the uh, DNA database are linked to other records on another computer system known as the Police National Computer. And the records on the Police National Computer contain a lot more information about the circumstances of the arrest of the individual. And those records are now also kept indefinitely. So essentially as a result of the change in the law on DNA, the police then said, well, we don't know at the police station whether a DNA sample has already been taken unless we can also keep the records of previous arrests. And that, that change did not go through, de through legislation. Um, it was essentially a change in procedure and policy. It was challenged by our information commissioner, but he lost the challenge. And therefore, for the first time in history now, if you're arrested for a recordable offence, in England, Wales, or Northern Ireland, you will have a permanent police record or until you're 100. So one of the key issues is the shifting purpose, which I think is very relevant to the discussions we've been having here. Originally, the idea was to use DNA in investigating a specific crime. And obviously, you can take DNA from a small group of suspects, you can compare it with a crime scene, and you can use that in your criminal investigation. But when the database was first established in Britain in 1995, uh, the real aim was to uh, cover those cases when you didn't get a match with a known suspect, and to include, um, basically, criminals, people convicted of criminal offences. But in order to uh, really investigate um, a relatively small number of types of offences. We've since moved from then to a situation where the main objective of the database is to in compare an individual's DNA profile with past all past stored crime scene DNA samples. So DNA is found at the scene of less than half a percent of recorded crimes. That means that if you're arrested on suspicion of committing a recorded crime, in most cases there's no DNA, and in most cases DNA is not relevant to those types of offences. So your DNA has been taken from you not because you are a suspect in a particular murder or rape or even less serious crime, but purely in order to run a speculative search. We've moved another step in terms of the purposes, which is the step that I find more disturbing, which is that if your DNA does not match any known past crime, you still have your DNA profile retained indefinitely, just in case it might match any future crime scene DNA profile. And that's a kind of a shift to a form of surveillance where your DNA is being retained in, in case you commit a future crime. And that has been justified in the past in terms of potential serial offenders um, where retaining their DNA has been argued 
um, is necessary or potentially useful if they reoffend. But now it's being done routinely uh, from anyone arrested from age 10 or above. And I put a question mark there on the last idea, but I'm going to talk about one of the concerns being about surveillance. And we know that our database has been searched by name. We know that during research projects, uh, searches such as typical Muslim names have also been made. So we know that it can be used in an entirely different way to try and look at the DNA of specific individuals and then potentially track either them or their relatives. So just to give you an idea of the breakdown, we've got about a million. These figures are from June 2006. We don't have any more recent ones on the breakdown, although we do have more recent totals. There's about a million, over a million people without any conviction, although some of those would have been awaiting trial. Uh, we estimated that about 100,000 of those are under 18. That was a very complicated calculation that I did using my PhD in mathematics <laughs> for the first time for years. It has been contested, but we're sticking to our figure. I think it's about right. Um, but it's not a figure that we can get out of the Home Office, however many times we've tried. Um, just to give you a feeling, only about 0.6 million of that, that total 3.5 million at that time were people with custodial sentences. So when we talk about innocent people on the database, when we talk about people with, who are not classified as innocent, that includes very many people with non-custodial sentences or with cautions. So that's people who've been arrested, taken to a police station, do not have the kind of plea bargaining process that Troy was mentioning, but, but simply are told they can go home if they accept a caution. So they haven't been through any courts. It's a police caution saying, you know, um, I, I admit that I was drunk and disorderly or whatever it is in order to get um, be allowed out of the police station and to go home. Um, the issue I was asked to talk about was particularly about discrimination and stigmatization. There's a strong inclusion bias in terms of who's on the database. About 42% of black men and about 77% of young black men are already on our database. Those figures are approximate. They're calculated by comparing our census figures with the DNA database figures, but the categories are different, so the, the appearance to a police officer is used on the database. So don't you know, think that they're very exact, but they certainly give you a very strong indication of uh, how biased the database is, and that 77% figure was accepted by ministers in Parliament. So, And there's some very approximate kind of indications that about half of those will be people with no... Uh, convictions or cautions. We've also got a strong bias towards young people on the database, which is reflected in, the, in that very large number of young black men. But young people, people under 18, are now being targeted for arrests by the police. Um, and that's happening for a number of reasons, but particularly to do with our government's so-called respect agenda and the promotion of the idea of antisocial behaviour as being a big problem amongst teenagers in Britain and something that needs a crackdown. Um, and part of the problem that's arisen is due to police targets, so that police are being given targets for numbers of arrests. Uh, when they can't uh, find anyone else at the end of the week, they go for the low-hanging fruit, the kids hanging around the bus stop who may or may not have kicked the dustbin over or whatever it is. And uh, they're very vulnerable now to being arrested for very minor offences. And DNA can be taken routinely without consent from the age of 10. There's also an issue about mentally ill people. We've recently had the, um, black, uh, an organisation called Black Mental Health UK has been in touch. They've started a campaign to try to get uh, mentally ill people removed from the database. We have no figures on the numbers, but we do know that it's routine. Uh, we do know that the population 